Hello, good evening, and welcome to PM Express. My name is Stephen Antti, your regular host. Tonight we will be talking about court reporting and journalism in light of the groundbreaking live broadcast of uh, tonight's um, today's proceedings at the Supreme Court. Ghana made history uh, with the broadcast court hearing. It is a landmark case in the political and historical spheres. It is only fitting then that the media be on hand to report events as they unfold. Reporting on court hearing is an essential part of journalism. It requires an understanding of local laws and knowing what can be reported and what cannot. Some journalists choose to specialize in court reporting and become experts in the field. Others, however, learn about it through their basic journalism training courses and by covering smaller court hearings. Now, covering the courts is one of the most challenging and um, fascinating beats in any news operation, uh, one which is rich with human drama. The courtroom, after all, is very much like a stage in which the actors, that is, the accused, the attorneys, the judge, and the jury all have their roles to play. And dependent on the severity of the alleged crime, the stakes can be very enormously high when the defendant's freedom or even his life are at issue. The very things that make this particular aspect of journalism attractive are also indeed the very things that can destroy a person's career and jeopardize fair hearing. Tonight we'll get some education on the intricacies of uh, this noble profession of journalism. And I have with me in the studio, I'm honored to have Nana Esilfi Kondria. Nana Esilfi Kondria is a lecturer in communications from the African University College of Communications. Nana Esilfi Kondria taught me while service when I was a student at the Ghana Institute of Journalism. So it makes it more honorable to have him here uh, in a studio tonight to discuss this. And then later on in the show, we'll get onto the phone lines and speak with um, former news editor at Joy FM, who is a lawyer as well, Samson Ladi Ayenini. He's the host of uh, News File, which is live on this channel every Saturday. And then also we'll get the perspectives of how the court uh, coverage of the Supreme Court hearing of the petition has gone with our own Anil Sabote, who will join us on online as well to um, give us some other perspectives. You can join us by text 1760. You can post your Facebook comments on our Facebook walls, facebook.com slash joy news, or you can send us a tweet. Our handle is at joy news on TV, and we'll gladly read them live here. No, no, it's great to have you here. I'm yes, honored. Fred, I, very honored. I am very happy mm. um, that um, I'm sitting with you and uh, many memories recalling I know. through my heart. <laughs> and, um, but I, I don't want it to be regarded like the schoolmaster and his That's student. right. <laughs> um, I guess we're going to have a good chat. Yes, I'm grateful to have you. I mean, when we look at what is happening, I mean, it's, it's, it's a landmark case in Ghana, historic. And then also, the different angle is that it is live, broadcast live on TV and live on radio. When you look back with your wealth of experience um, as a journalism trainer, did you ever foresee this day coming? Unfortunately, the younger generation don't seem to have learned the history. Um, I grant that the, the, the history books are not really replete with instances, but I, I can recall one which was also landmark in the sense of it having political connotations mm. all over it. This was the time that we called uh, in justify your inclusion mm. sort of. You know, um, in the various tents of coup d'etat, earliest on in our history, uh, both parties, the party to the right and the party to the left, after they'd been ousted, would have been investigated. Mm. And that kind of merry-go-round therefore netted a few 
stalwarts in either the left or the right wing of politics in this country. And this particular time, uh, there were two um, giants, K. Bidema mm. and Victor Oso. And um, a commission was set up, headed by Mr. Justice, uh, the Chief Justice, E.N.P. Soar. And so the, the matter was telecast. Uh, they didn't sit at the Supreme Court or in any of the high courts, but I think they, th they were found at a studio, a makeshift studio, in, at the castle. And, you know, we saw them live, even though the population of viewers at that time must have been very mm. small. Um, we have to be very careful not to overstate that this is his historically, it is necessarily, ever since that break, yeah. um, we haven't had any of its sort and um but i want to raise that kind of footnote that we have had one at before least it wouldn't in, be the first it wouldn't be the mm. first mm. so i mean um when you are you are a journalist or you're a reporter who is covering a case as sensitive as this one i mean bearing in mind that you need to uh serve the interests of your audience as well as be be conscious of your professional obligation in a courtroom. What are the things that uh, a journalist should look out for when reporting a case of this nature? Uh, you've got to understand what are at stake, the case for, the case against, in the main summarily. And you've got to be alert about the submissions for and against by councils. Uh, you don't necessarily have to take profuse notes because councils will not wait for you to say stop sir mm -hmm. and so um here you use your retentive memory quite a lot but the retentive memory will be helped if only you have done your homework read the case in terms of the positions of either side and haven't gotten that at the back of your mind you listen very carefully because some councils will be interrupting the, their colleagues on points of order and objections, etc. The court would uphold or will say, you know, the council could go on. And all of these things um, give you a burden as a reporter as to how to really interject these objections and these upheld. Would you necessarily or would you not? So you weigh whether, how much of that will be of interest to the report that you are presenting. At the end of the day, if it's live, the report that you are running, mm -hmm. the OB on, OB meaning the outside yeah. broadcast on. And so I think it is more burdensome for a reporter in this, uh, at this kind of state stage uh, in the whole profession than it has for you just going around to sit in the court and come to sit behind the radio and do mm -hmm. it. Um, it is more difficult again for the ordinary, you mentioned, I remember I mentioned Obi, that's outside broadcast. It's more difficult for you because in your case, sometimes you are seen on, this, on, the, on the screen, on the monitor, at other times you are not. But at all times you must kind of be, your face must be shown. Mm. And um, if a junior, they, you know, some people have the microphone fright, others have the, the um, light, arc lights fright and of all these things and uh, they, they really weigh down on you for a starter but once you've passed the baptism of fire you take it in your stride bear in mind your code of ethics bear in mind that you needn't say anything that might be prejudicial either in your exuberance or haven't listened to some other side so again I'm coming to the point of influences yeah. Whereas you the process before and during and after you're listening to all kinds of commentaries from outsiders, professing views that you may be willing to ask questions and you may not be willing, but they will come in on you and tell you things. Mm -hmm. You are learning. You've got to be submissive to that. You're learning. But then at the end of the day, it's you sitting there. It's your reporting how you weigh things, and we call it, as you know, striking the balance. Yeah. You've got to be very objective. But the, the, the danger here is that oftentimes we, call, we, we tend to think that striking the balance is a, it's a builder's uh, level. It's no mathematical equation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if the other side has not spoken, you daren't say anything, especially in the court proceedings. Mm -hmm. If the other side has not spoken, what you've got to do is that the other side is here to reply. Mm -hmm. And you get on with your job. But the tendency among the younger generation, I'm afraid, is, is an exuberance to want to raise, to listen, or to bring in the other side. So when you observe the reportage, the reportage, both uh, electronic media and print media, what are your observations um, about the trends of reporting on this petition from the day it started? Yes, um, they haven't had any training. This is the point. Mm. And it, it, it saddens me. There have been so many gaps in there. Um, but I think they're going to learn. As I said, it's a baptism of fire for every one of them. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to learn on their feet very rapidly. My prayer is that the exuberance of being there will not overtake the, the sense of, of objectivity, the sense of duty. You, it's not you. You are presenting a historical situation to a whole nation and beyond. So you've got to be extremely careful. Sinter's style and diction. Mm. The content of it, the style you use to present it, bear in mind the, the, uh, the, 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 the impediments or the constraints of the box that you are operating from, right? And the diction, especially the language. Because any cough, any sneeze, let me put it that metaphorically, mm. um, could be misinterpreted. Mm. And it's you. Then the last thing, you as a, never seek to be the star. Yeah. The tendency for some of these people, as I've seen, are trying to become stars. Making and themselves making the news. The news. And it's not him. It's the most erroneous thing that anyone can do, mm -hmm. especially on the box as a reporter in an important case such as this. Now, two things you've raised. Um, you've spoken about striking the right balance. You've also spoken about training. In doing my training as a, as a journalist, the kinds of opportunities I had when I, I did internships with Spectator or Mirror and I was reporting from the courtroom, my reports mainly focused on human interest. Maybe there was a rape somewhere, maybe there was robbery somewhere, somebody is uh, maybe jailed to 10 years, 20 years. Those were of interest. So. I mean, continuously, we didn't get the opportunity to cover important issues of this nature. Would you say that it is because of this, coming along this line of training, that there appear to be a lapse in technical competence in reporting accurately on an important matter like this? Uh, I, I would want to um, drop a caveat on the word mm. accurately. I'll come to it to explain okay. why I would want you to tamp hold that a bit yeah. in the cold. Mm. Uh, the fact is that the systems that we have had would not permit specialization. Okay. Right? Um, we've taken everything as a, in a kind of potpourri. Uh, journalists have hitherto been the jacks of all trades. I would not say today that they are masters of none, mm. but the mastery ha has not been recognized, A, by employers, by owners of the, of the institutions. And therefore, owners have not. And the people who are managers, indeed, have not looked at the youngsters and say, this has a potential to do that, that. And let us shift this person into that area. Now, in the absence of that, and uh, no, jack of all trades, what could have been done, again, if the vision was right, that was that you pick on people with professional knowledge, not professional training in journalism, mm -hmm. the professional knowledge in the subject, economist, um, what do you call lawyers, sociologists, nutritionists. So every case that is there, if you are lucky to have them on board as in situ, as your employees, mm -hmm. then you can take them through the, the rhythms and the basics in journalism. And you set them loose. They know the rudimentaries, mm -hmm. so they won't make mistakes. Now, in the absence of that, I've always felt that the chap who has been in at the job, learned on the job from the lecture hall, 
uh, is always a better asset than picking on the chap who has become, I'm not being denigatory, yeah. but I'm saying the, with confidence that that chap is, is be your best asset to train, yeah. to specialize, mm -hmm. because he has learned so much. Mm -hmm. He knows so much. Yeah. He can de determine how to jump every next hurdle in the process on his feet or her feet. But at this moment, I'm wondering again that everybody clamoring for money, that owners will be really able to pay those outside specialists and train them. And then again, they, somehow the education system we have has made some of us a little bit swollen herded, if I might use that one, that they wouldn't want you to pick me, pick the map as economist or uh, whatever and say, I'm taking you to my training school. I mean, they will find it a little bit difficult, mm -hmm. and they will argue. They haven't arrived yet, you know. So your best bet is to concentrate from within. Yeah, but having said that, again, you come to this accuracy thing. Again, the chap who is an in chap knows about all the rudiments of accuracy, mm -hmm. so you won't have problems. Yeah. Um, he may falter to uh, his human, but he's capable of quickly doing the reparation for that damage. You understand that? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a mixture of the system itself. And of course, our courts have not themselves, like every other system in this country, the financial houses will not open up to journalists. They always say that uh, you cannot trust them. Yes, to some extent. It is it a is, systemic it, problem. It, though. It, it, it is due to their training. It is due to the mix on board where you have sojourners and then they have been joined by what, what you call social whatever you call them they are having fun <laughs> yes it's not structured <laughs> and then you have the scholar literati those who have trained in the classroom and lecture halls they happen they remain the minority yeah. and it's the remuneration the scales and the ability of employers people who invest their money into this industry to recognize that you cannot win without employing professionals and paying them a good day's pay for a good day's job, for a good day's rest. It's very important. And these are all, for me, as I sit back and watch what's going on at the court, I see all of them be either in silhouettes or plainly. Mm -hmm. But this is what we need to do. This is it's probably to do. going to begin to talk some kind of practical um, imperatives to us mm -hmm. that we should adjust our attitudes to these youngsters in the field. They are not dancers, but once you've not given them the opportunity, once you've not challenged them, for all of them there, every mistake they make, they start kicking their heels. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow they'll come differently. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a fine opportunity for them, but I would advise that they take their time in right. the exuberance. Now, um, I'm told that I'm joined on the line by um, our own reporter, Annie Osabote, who is uh, the man on the beat uh, at the Supreme Court. Annie, it's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. You? Yeah, so, I mean, you are being in the thick of affairs, and you saw this coming. When I say you saw this coming, uh, there were discussions here and there. There were speculations that the petition hearing at the Supreme Court will um, be telecast live. Did, did it come as a surprise to you at the end? I mean, honestly speaking, it was a surprise, because I remember at the last attempt date, I mean, it came up, but uh, it was overruled. Even I remember the lawyers for the petitioners, the person of Philip Addison raised the issue of uh, they wanting to use even projectors and other other materials to to as part of the process, as part of the uh, wanting to present evidence. And uh, the court overruled that. So I mean all, all of us were kind of uh, looking forward to today that I will go to the court and it will be the normal process. It will not be telling much. But then I, w I was at a court when the, last night when the NBC were filing their written affidavit in response to what the petition has uh, brought. And then only to get to the office and be told that uh, this is the, the, the proceedings be on television. Initially, I didn't believe that. I dismissed that. You know, and I even kind of went on a bet and I told one of my colleagues that if indeed it is true, then I will walk from the Supreme Court to the office, you know, naked, so to speak. But uh, lo and behold, we went to the court, and 
everything was shown t- live on television. And I think uh, so mm. far, the commentary I'm hearing from people is kind of a good sign and a good right. thing as well. Yeah. Right. Ani, I, I know you, you, you would have to correct me if I'm wrong, that you... Your, your, your legal background is constrained in a sense that you're not a lawyer, neither have you been to law school. Have you found reporting on this election petition particularly challenging, for which you feel that you need extra training? Well, I think extra training, everybody needs that. And like you said, exactly, I'm not a lawyer. I never trained as a lawyer. I never trained, and uh, I've not had any, you know, uh, short course in law or whatever. And I must say that when I started court reporting itself, initially I was struggling a bit, you know, because there was jargon that was being used and all of those things. And, uh, you know, sometimes you need to go back to the lawyers and ask for explanations. Also lean on some of your colleagues who have had the experience of reporting from the court for a couple of years, two, three years, for them to be able to break down some of the things. So day in and day out, as we move along, I was trying to, I was learning the ropes. Mm. And even with the case, for example, when it started, I know some terminology that I didn't quite get right. And sometimes I report and, you know, that, that wouldn't be the case. And but fortunately, I have lawyer friends who call me and say, oh, it is not like this. It should have been that way. So every day I come home and uh, I review my own report. I cut the report. I, I file on the radio. I listen and I compare them to the very thing that the lawyers say. So the following morning, I go and I was like, okay, what is new that I need to do? So it's like every day more or less like a, a learning experience because day in and day out, new terms are coming up. And sometimes you sit back and you're confused. What exactly does the person mean? Because you as a reporter, it is your job to simplify the issues for the listeners to understand. But if you also come back and produce the same technology that are being used in the courtroom, then essentially we are not communicating, but you are informing. You are more like uh, complicating the issues the listener but uh mm. by and large i think I, I see myself growing but there are a lot more room for me to, to to improve but i just want to believe that as we move with this particular case i'll be able to find my feet you know, yeah, right. Issues. Now, as an award-winning journalist, uh, which I know you to be, uh, you are very curious. I know that also. And uh, your penchant or determination to get to the bottom of every story is clear in all the reports that you have filed. Do you get the sense that uh, your curiosity along the line uh, was was? seem to have been stifled in any way as you as you went about reporting this petition? But for now, not yet, not at all. Because you know, interestingly, I have built around myself, you know, friends from both sides of the team, from the petitioner side and that of the NDC side as well. So from time to time they call me and they tell me that this is what is happening, this mm-hmm. is what we are going to do. And and because you trust that you know you can do a good job that's what they come to you so i'm, I'm yet to experience that mm. that particular thing even right. if you go to the courtroom for example and there are court registrars who are willing to give you a tip or two they're only saying okay don't miss it i give you this or that but uh, i think this will help you in your reporting when your report just say this don't say that so yeah i mean i'm yet to to encounter something like that i, I pray that it, it doesn't happen but uh, I can say so far, it means smooth sailing for me, speaking for myself, yeah. Right, so, Ani, um, I have uh, the next if Kondia in the studio, but I'll ask you one question, then I will seek uh, some commentary on that from, from him as well. Now, I know everybody's happy that this uh, petition is to be telecast live. No doubt about it. But there are so many other professionals who are worried that perhaps too much information thrown out there through this live telecast could create some problems, especially with the fanatic supporters of both political parties, and that we could actually be walking a tightrope. Do you feel that way sometimes? Well, I'm not too sure, because I remember that, uh, like, they said the telecast is in the interest of the public, and... You, you you already know that the, the 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 public is very much excited or looking forward to this. I think for me, what the telecast will now do is to strip this whole issue of the propaganda or the bragging rights that what the NDC and the MPP always bring. Because you go to the court, and depending on how the case or the issues went for them, they spin it to their the advantage and the disadvantage of the other party. But here's the case that the thing has been televised. We all watched and we're able to inform ourselves of the issue. So it is 
more difficult for let's say a, a party propagandist from party A or party B to come and put a spin on that. So for me, I think in a way it's a blessing, but in essence, the propaganda bit of of of, of people wanting to score cheap political points. Yes. Right. Um, so now now these issues that I'm bringing, uh, I'm bringing out from Anio Sabote's answers. Do you, do you feel worried, too, that perhaps this live telecast could have its negatives? Yes, I mean, he says he is not. He thinks that it's, there's excitement. You see, um, you need to be very careful with these things. And it, I emphasized over and over again that the reporter must be extremely careful in his presentation, center style and diction. Because he said also that yeah. each time he went back home, he really did an, a review of what yeah. was the necessity. The necessity was that, did I do it right? Can I do it better? Great for education, great for him, and great for us. But the, the thing is that it's good and it's bad. The bad has a greater potential to turn things upside down. He mentioned propaganda. We have to be extremely careful, whereas it is an idea that you want to stifle the unnecessary propaganda. Propaganda is spin. Propaganda is three-quarters lies. Mm. You understand it from, to my advantage yeah. and to run over you. Uh, the people listening, no matter how hard you try, you will have to stay up for the lawyers to speak. Now, if you've got a lawyer, a young chap who is slick, and very theatrical. The system enables him to act and, and dramatize, and, and, dramatize it all. and impress the, the people who don't understand all the intricacies of the law that is going on. And so you have made them the larger population, not intended, inadvertently, believe that because of the lots of theatricals and dramatization. Um, he's kind of winning, and that mm -hmm. my side is going to win. At the end of the day, when, unfortunately, the court doesn't go by it by the uh, triaticals, they deal with points of law. Mm. And at the end of the day, it turns out against my expectations. Uh, you know what can happen? Um, I don't know whether I could be permitted to make a, 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 a reference. You know, People say that Kwame Nkrumah was dictatorial, and that to the extent that he, was, he dismissed the Aquaculture Court. No. What happened was this, that Nkrumah's case was that Sir Aquaculture had more than 48 hours a day to him. It's done everywhere. It's not in the open. The independence of the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature, yes, are, you know, are independent, but they are tampered because each backstops for the other, and they overlap. In certain ways, in the processing of their mandates, they really confer. And this was the time that, you know, at that time in Ghana, you dare to be said to have made an attempt on Nkrumah's life. I mean, the Gamma was a book rack. <laughs> so uh, the public had grown up into that kind of psyche mm. that whosoever they've been got hold of, was guilty, ab initio. So all that in Krumah's case was that, now, if, as I was saying, it turns out the other way because of these theatricals, right, that it was, that the potential is there. Mm -hmm. And he sought to preempt it by expecting Akokosa mm -hmm. to forewarn him. And he would have asked Akokosa, give me two weeks. He would have organized rallies, right, unbeknown. This is something between the executive and the judiciary, which goes on all mm -hmm. the time. Then he would have organized rallies, eh? and he would have feigned not to have understood questions that people were asking. Mm -hmm. He was a very adept at that. And the end of the day, he would say, oh, come on, they are brothers. I've forgiven them. Leave it altogether. Mm -hmm. As soon as at the end of that rally occurred, Osajifu has forgiven them. So they are not bothered about what the court was saying. Then a week or two, Akukosa court would have gone to say that, yes, uh, we didn't find anything. Oh, the man has been, the people have been forgiven by Osajifu. The idea here was that then a potential political explosion would have been 
stifled. Yeah. You understand? Yes. It? That was the psychology was using. So anyway, be that as it may, it occurred that that's why some people, as he rightly referred to, said, a little bit uh, uh, shaky about mm. this thing. So, but mm. then it gives him and his colleagues out there the greatest of burden to aim my, to do my better empathy each time and they prayer go to, the go to them. That <laughs> then Nancy Vikondia <laughs> is a lecturer at AUCC and uh, we'll take a short break. You can join us on the show by sending your text, your comments by text 1760 or post them on our Facebook walls, facebook.com slash journeys. We'll be right back. Welcome back to PM Express. My name is Stephen Enti, and I'm here with Nana Esilfi Kondia, who is a lecturer at AUCC. He's a very seasoned journalism trainer, and we're discussing uh, the issues of getting the court reports uh, for this petition that is being telecast live. Uh, Blue Rose Limited is a leading real estate developer in Africa with affordable housing. And they present to you shelter for all with as low as 50,000 Ghana cities. You can get a two bedroom house from Blue Rose Limited. Uh, Blue Rose is located at Bujumburam, close to Kaf University College. Blue Rose Limited, quality and affordable housing for all. You can call their hotline 020-209-622-030-2241-459-020-435301. And Regimano uh, Gray Estate with over 20 years unbeatable record at Catamanso has two to three bedroom houses with expansion possibilities that is set within gated communities with superb 24-7 street lights, landscaped areas and social amenities including sports complex, education facility, shopping center and health facilities. Experience the new phase of urban living at the Balloon Gate Apartments, Kwabenya, where Regimano Gray has brought to bear their expertise and unparalleled hallmarks in designing two-bedroom apartments with two bathrooms, a spacious living room, a fitted kitchen, a balcony that has become the delight of homeowners, corporate bodies and property investors. Uh, with an effect efficient and effective estate management service on site, your property can only appreciate in value. You can reach uh, Regimental Gray on 020-222-9916 and 020-222-9918. If you are in the UK, you can uh, reach them on 208 for a guided tour and get your allocation. Regimano Gray, express your value. Regimano Gray, your dream, your choice, I promise. And uh, welcome back, Nana. So we've been talking about this court reporting and um, what it holds for young, younger journalists who are out there to one bring out the 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 the, the story, tell the story, and also whilst telling the story, be conscious of um, their ethical obligation. Now, I said in my introduction earlier that. Um, the very thing that makes this particular aspect of journalism attractive are also the same things that can destroy a person's career and jeopardize a fair hearing. How do journalists juggle this delicate uh, responsibility on their hand? The, 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 the exits for you are just, you know, there are two um, forms of reporting the court. Americans call it justice reporting. It's a straightforward one, just as you cited, right? The one you uh, you know that Kofiata yeah. stole a goat, he denied, <laughs> and he was um, jailed six months mm -hmm. despite, mm -hmm. you know, denial. That's a straightforward yeah. one. Then there's these complicated ones. Each of these complicated ones has its own difficulties. Habeas corpus is different, sedition is different, mm -hmm. Con even contempt of court is different, mm -hmm. and high-profile corruption and political cases such as we have now, they are very different. So each one has to learn, you, and you learn as you go along. It's not going to come overnight. So the important thing you must hold is my understanding of the case. Who is indicted? What is the indictment? 
What is this defense? What would prosecution say? And finally, what is the verdict? You understand it? In the process, if it's tough, all that you need to do is just go to the court registry. I'm happy he said that he has got friends on both sides. Mm -hmm. In the court system and in reporting, you have to cultivate, right, the registry especially, and the lawyers. Yeah. They, but you just don't cultivate them. They have to win your trust. And you've got to keep that trust alive. Sometimes something will be told to you on a delicate basis. The tendency among this generation is to rush to print. And many have come, you know, stranded because of that. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to. Uh, you're taught in school, on record, off record, right? On deep background, on background, mm -hmm. for guidance. If you obey those rules, Right? You're coming along to the court with that, you are safe first. Mm -hmm. But back in the news room and at the news desk, the editorial floor too, there are problems. Yeah. You have some people at the editorial desk in particular who will butcher it because A, they either want to impose themselves on it or they don't understand, but they will want the reporter to write as if they were right. Yeah. But the important thing is that they've got also to be very careful. So it's not just the chap. If it's live, it's live. But if it's something that's been brought to you, be careful. Right. And I've just been told that uh, we're joined on a lie by Samson Ladi Ayenini, who is a lawyer and a journalist. He uh, was editor, news editor, Joy FM. It's currently the host of uh, News Fire. Samson, it's great to have you here. Hi, Steve. Yes. I mean, you are a lawyer, and uh, the critical issue here is that in balancing the quest for transparency when you are reporting in court, you also have to bear in mind the court rules. I mean, tell me what journalists should look out for so that they will thread this uh, delicate line cautiously and be able still to bring us the story as it unfolds. You would uh, find that the justices and in the explanation given by the presiding judge, Justice William Atuguba, he said that this was <coughs> uh, because this matter, more especially, is a constitutional matter and people deserve the right to also participate in it through uh, getting to see the process or uh, witness it for themselves through uh, television, if that is the way it can be extended to them, because the court act uh, requires, and also the rules require that the court should sit in open. And he actually referred to Article uh, 126 of the Constitution and suggested also that it was, it was justice emanate from the people and that it was just fair that the people get to participate in it. In the, from that note, you would discover that they recognize the fundamental importance that the people have in having access to this uh, particular case and the information, everything that uh, goes about it so that nothing is shrouded in secrecy or in mystery. But something, I'm yeah. sure that the journalists mm. also uh, you would find that uh, who, particularly those who have been going to the Supreme Court to cover it, you would find that they feel some liberation because uh, before now, they knew that you couldn't take even your recorder into the courtroom. And even if you recorded, you'll be in trouble, you'll be in contempt of court, and you could not even use uh, their sound bites and so on. So I'm sure that they are extremely excited but i also discovered in the courtroom that you find that the journalists because this is just so new and this is the very uh, apex uh, courts of the land you find that they are acting a bit uh, in a bit of uh, too much they are being too much you know cautious in what they do and i'm suspecting that in the course of the the days and the weeks they are likely to feel 
um, but, but, but something, basis. but something. Um, I mean, in the in the in the quest to uh, allow the people, the general citizens, to participate in this trial, um, I mean, is it not fair for journalists who are covering it to be cautious? Like you've just raised that some of them are cautious, and perhaps maybe I put the word in your mouth too cautious for your liking. Is it not fair yeah. for them to be extremely cautious in reporting such a sensitive? Court, court case? Um, well, they, they have to be, but um, I want them to feel that sense of freedom. Um, and I think the, the, the biggest problem that uh, most of the journalists I discover would encounter is the inability to properly interpret some of the actions of the court or to be able to situate them, you know, um, what they do in the proper context and when the courts whatever they do often you would find that they may use some latin words or expressions and you may need to be able to have the training to be able to better appreciate right. even the things that they are doing in very uh, plain english some of them you certainly need uh, some training to be able to properly appreciate otherwise you might misreport uh, elsewhere where you would definitely have uh, journalists who are who have some training in the law to cover such a big assignment mm -hmm. unfortunately here i'm sure that uh, you're not going to have that happening and i think that is the area that you might say it's all right to exercise caution and be very completely sure of what you have before you go out and talk about it um when the uh, the two parties were fighting over whether or not uh, fight on quote quote on quote they they were fighting over whether or not their case must go on that the petitioners should open their case today you know there were people who were shocked and didn't actually appreciate what exactly it was but as as a practitioner I knew you know rights away that it wasn't anything new mm. that this wasn't strange that in the very in the in the very ordinary cases that we conduct in, in court every day right uh, especially when you have filed your statement of claim and the defendants have filed their statement of defense you go into the witness box i mean when you have taken uh, directions pleadings have closed and you take directions like in this case they took directions we are aware mm. Um, you the the parties can straight away start the the case, and unfortunately, here is a different ball game. Right. Even though they filed their petitions and they filed, they got the answers filed. The court has made a ruling that it will only uh, admit affidavit evidence and not oral uh, mm. testimony mm. in court. Right. So, so something. Find that. Yeah. yeah. So something, I mean, you're a journalist, you're a lawyer as well. I mean, I, I want to wrap up with you and, and ask for your prediction in terms of media coverage. What do you foresee happening in terms of media coverage by the time this case run its full course? Okay, uh, just this morning I found that there will be some difficulties that uh, some of the media houses will encounter in trying to cover this uh, uh, proceeding. I discovered immediately that you would find that in the court, it is not as if it's a, a rehearsed drama that is being presented, and so things will go on without any breaks. Mm -hmm. There will be breaks, and you will need someone with a, some understanding to be able to connect to the viewers or the listeners and attempt to explain things while, for example, the judges are, are going into chambers or while they are you know, trying to communicate with each other to try and take a decision, you know, or sometimes they are just uh, writing, taking notes, uh, trying to give a ruling, and within the period you find that if it's radio, there will be dead air, you have to play some adverts or commercials, and if it's TV, uh, people will just be looking at the pictures, and so you need, you know, people who understand what is going on to be able to connect to the people and explain what is going on to them, and I think that's that is key and mm. should be able to help the process as well. Right. Otherwise, it's going to be boring. 
And Very. people should expect that there are going to be a lot more <laughs> breaks in the course of the trial. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. Uh, Samson Lalia Yenini is the host of News File. He's a lawyer. He's a former news editor at Joy FM. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back to continue with our discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back to PM Express. My name is Stephen Ente and I'm here with Nana Esilfi Kondra. So, Nana, you heard something. Who is the lawyer? Uh, speak extensively about um, their approaches to reporting in the court of law and the case and what he expects the how he expects the coverage to go by the time it runs its full course. Do you have any uh, skepticism? I know there are people who were skeptical in the first place that this uh, petition was to be telecast live. Did you hold any such skepticism? Yes, I did. I did initially, and I'm still groping my mind about his reference to Justice Atuguba's case mm. as citing or standing on 126. Mm. Um, says that the that kind of freedom of participation whatever came from the people mm -hmm. the trouble is that as far as this one is concerned the people are spectators mm -hmm. and in spectatoring I've already said and I'm repeating that we need to be very careful with any slick chap dramatizing to extend that the telly will make that ability to dramatize the theatricals be more impressive than the people absorbing to understand the points of law. And so um, I think it's a burden on the journalists. There's a certain um, unmeant, really, uh, emphasis about necessarily being a lawyer. I met in my upbringing uh, persons who hadn't gone to secondary school. And they were excellent court reporters. Mm. And they did the job well. So the thing is, your attentive memory, your ability to balance, you need a disciplined mind. If he has read law, she has read law, and is trained in journalism, superb. Fine, it's a good advantage. But I don't want that to be made that just the, the flag mm -hmm. in order to the, 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 this, uh, this orient it. The younger generation will have the potential to want to go into that specialization. You do that, then employers will say, all right, we're going to take only lawyers to do it for us. Then what about the rest? They remain passengers, but they are your assets. And so I am not rooting necessarily against one profession against the other, but all I'm saying is that the mixture is excellent. But of the mixture, I think I would prefer him like that, having had that background and having gone into it. But it's not a big deal, you know? All you need to do is to, just listen to the summary at the end of the day. Yeah. That's your best chance. And these judges are very capable. Some of them are very erudite writers, scripters. Mm. Yeah. And they always want to do that to impress with respect. You understand that? So all you do is just sit quietly and wait to take all the profuse notes that you want mm. from it. But be careful as to how you use that script. Some can call you to chambers and dictate what they said to you and explain it to you. If you are willing to ask them questions, they guide you. Well, they should have the humility to go into the chamber. Your, your lordship, I don't understand this. And they love it. They will want to teach you because they know that if you represent them, the law will say, bring that young fellow for contempt. Mm -hmm. And it is not something that is rosy for them to do. Yeah. So, um, you know, Lord Chief Justice Atkins, 1936, in a case, uh, the, uh, the law is not a cloistered virtue where to, uh, even angels and martyrs will not dare to trot. Mm -hmm. But then you need to be very careful as not to A, disparage the honor of the court and impugn the integrity of the persons presiding. So this again is the is the is the is this the 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 creed that anyone reporting from on the side of journalism should hold in their hands and in their minds and their heart to approach it. I'm saying at the end of the day, these ca these kids will come triumphant, mm -hmm. but they would have gone through hell. Some of them will be able to tell their stories; others may not. Mm -hmm. But then they would have gone 
through her, and I wish them well. Yes. Now, um, <laughs> finally, uh, Nana, how, how crucial is this live telecast to the widespread acceptance of the outcome of the court? It depends on how you sustain it. When um, this young man, you, uh, uh, Laddie Samson, yeah. Samson, was speaking, I was almost tempted to ask you to ask him uh, um, from the trend of his arguments whether he is expecting that this trend will be mm. continued. We tried to do Parliament, didn't it? Yes. It's not more than 40 years ago the British Parliament, the, lo the oldest of them all, introduced the cameras into the chamber. Even that, it is edited and subject to the, um, the will of the House, as they say. Mind you, you are always there if in the court, in Parliament, at the behest, the, uh, the, the benign behest yeah. of the court or Parliament, so they can withdraw it. And they can ask you to get not out to of it, not to come again. <laughs> so um, the thing to do is to win their trust. The thing to do is to listen to them and don't go overboard. Right, but I'm sure these youngsters are doing that. I, I, I really hope that um, the elders in the back rooms, in the various newsrooms, are taking note. Um, if I was one of them, I would just find a panel to judge these youngsters that are, who has the potential, who can be trained, who may have to um, go back to the back room, and, and that, that's not the end of the job. But let's try him or give him or her a chance on the other. Specialization has not been the forte here. And I think that this op must open the floodgates for thinking about for specialization. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nana Esilfi Kondia is a seasoned journalism trainer. He's a lecturer at AUCC. Uh, and thanks to you for joining us uh, on the show, making time with us. Uh, we're grateful to Samson Ladia Yenini and... Uh, Anio Sabote, who were able to join us on four. My name is Stephen Enti. Join us again uh, tomorrow for another edition. Good night.